If you weren't awake this morning, <laughs> you are now. So thanks, guys. That was awesome. Lord is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. It is uh, great to see you all here on this beautiful morning. Uh, couldn't ask for any better. There's snow on the ground. The Winter Olympics are on. It's just a great time. How many of you like the Winter Olympics? <laughs> yeah, it's this thing, AJ, that they have over in China right now. Um, how many of you like to ski? All right, take notes. That's going to be our next uh, Timberline um, <laughs> outing. So, uh, yeah, I, I love winter. I love skiing. I love Winter Olympics. And I, it sticks in my head there's some other sporting thing going on today, too, but I kind of forget. I don't <laughs> Something tonight, I think. But um, So uh, besides that, a few announcements this morning. Um, just it is a busy day besides the Olympics and that thing, the snut tonight. We also have quizzing. That's right. Right here, <laughs> 2 o'clock, uh, here at Timberline, so I encourage you guys to come on out, support our quizzers, um, it's going to be a great afternoon. So again, that's at 2 o'clock. Um, a couple things with Guatemala, and some exciting stuff to report to you. So first off, for our trip, there's still a few uh, gift bag needs that we need to put together, and there's still, uh, the Ziploc bags are still out on the table with a list of stuff. If you have any questions, you can talk to Michelle about that. Uh, it's still also collecting matchbox cars. So if any of you have matchbox cars, new or gently used, that you'd like to donate and send down to Guatemala, please. Or Hot Wheels. Or Hot Wheels. Okay, thanks for, yes. We're not discriminatory here. We'll take either. Uh, and also, so we do have all the T-shirts we need now. We make jump ropes out of these, but we can use any help that you'll be willing to give us in cutting these. So if you would like to volunteer to spend an evening watching TV, cutting up T-shirts, talk to Michelle. She can give you instructions on how to do it. It would be um, just a real blessing. It is a lot of fun being down in Guatemala with these, making them with the kids then. It's just a real winner and something we're excited about. Um, men's night, February 26th, uh, movie night, Show Me the Father. We're having pizza at 6 o'clock, the movie at 7, and a discussion afterwards. And the movie is from the creators of Facing the Giants, Courageous, Fireproof. And it's a, a movie, and it should provoke some great discussion on fatherhood. Uh, I encourage you to come out for that. Um, so ushers come up for the bucket offering. So I have some kind of exciting news about the bucket offering as they're coming up. So we were telling you that we were trying to raise money for the food offering, or food to be able to give to our village. You guys can go ahead and take the buckets and get started. Uh, and this is our not our regular offering. This is every penny going to alleviate extreme poverty. We have been raising money for food for our village, Piedras Negras. And this week, World Help contacted us and let us know that we sent the money down to finish the evangelical church in our village. And the cost came in considerably less than what they were expecting. So with the difference that was left over, they were actually able to pay for the food for the village which meant that the $7,500 check that we had just sent them for food, they're going to be returning to us now. Um, and so we're continuing to collect money for the bucket offering. We're continuing to kind of hold that. We're going to be praying about it, seeking the Lord about what's next and what we're going to be doing with that. So that money will be set aside. Every penny of that will go to extreme poverty in one shape or form, and we'll let you know about that. But it was exciting just to kind of hear that that worked out that way for Guatemala. Um, 
Also, just by way of congratulations, Jesse and Eleanor Gibson are here with their new little one, Colton. So, you guys, congratulations. <laughs> it's great, great to see you here this morning. And with that, if you guys will stand, take some time to greet each other, and we'll continue in worship.
you are the only one who is worthy of our praise and worthy of our honor. God, we come and we bring that to you. We bring you our glory because you are the most deserving. God, you are worthy of all of it. God, we thank you that we can boldly approach your throne this morning, that you care, that you hear us. God, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you that he made the switch for us. God, that our righteousness belongs to him, and he is the only one who could give it because he is perfect, and he is spotless, and he is blameless. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you this morning. In your precious name, amen. You can be seated. This is what God's word says. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And listen to the last verse. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a new song this morning. Um, just about the promises of God, of his faithfulness. Um, and I just invite you to, yeah, to listen to the words and to sing along if you know them.
You are our king, you are our redeemer, and we are simply your people. We are the clay in your hands. And God, we acknowledge that if we don't surrender to you and submit to you, that we try and go our own way and live our own purposes, and that fails every time. So God, we acknowledge today that because you are our king, because you are the potter, Lord, we ask that you would change our hearts, that we would not seek after our own gain and then flop on our faces over and over again, but that we would seek your honor and glory. That is life abundance, that we would live in your kingdom, that we would represent you to the world in kindness, in truth, in courage, in grace. Lord, would you change our hearts that we may become like you? In Jesus' name. You may be seated, and the ushers may come forward. And because I enjoy talking to the Lord, let's pray again. Lord, thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. You know, some people give because they feel like they have to. The religious people in the temple, when Jesus was there, they gave hundreds and hundreds so that they could look cool. And then there was the widow there who gave two pennies, and that's all she had. But she gave because she acknowledged your glory, and she acknowledged that you were worth it. So, Lord, today, this offering, we don't give because we want to look cool. 
but we give with cheerful hearts because we know that you are the giver of everything and that you are the giver of life. And so we give with joy, we give with trust, we give with anticipation and eagerness because we know that this is your kingdom and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead. So good morning. My name is Benji. I'm one of the pastors here at Timberline, among others. And I went to school for social work once upon a time because I wanted to work with difficult people. And here I am with y'all, living my dream. <laughs> I, I am kidding. I, I studied social work because I wanted to meet people that I otherwise wouldn't meet, people who felt like no one cared about them, and I wanted to offer to be on their team and also be equipped to be on their team. That's why I studied social work. And so I studied and I practiced. And I was a student, you know, like I was learning things. I had no real experience, just a lot of ideals in my head that I was excited about. Until one day, I was given a badge and a caseload. And it was my job to knock on a stranger's door and ask them about the bruises on their child or the lack of food in the house or the lack of a house and the lack of a door to knock on or the fact that the child was afraid to go home at night. All of the sudden, I wasn't a student anymore. All of the sudden, I didn't feel so equipped. I felt like a kid, not like a real caseworker. But the truth is, I was a caseworker. I was trained. I had the badge. I had the authority. Well, to, caseworkers don't actually have that much authority for whatever it's worth. Judges make decisions. I was a real caseworker. If I didn't know the answers to the questions that were asked, that didn't mean I wasn't a caseworker. That meant I had some research to do because that's what caseworkers do. Any time that I felt inadequate, it didn't invalidate my identity. It just meant that I had a little bit of work to do. So this new responsibility that I had now, not as a student, but as a caseworker, was simultaneously thrilling. It's what I had been working towards for years. It was terrifying. It was an answer to prayer. And also, it was something that I knew I would need to grow into and that I would never fully master. I would have to continue learning and growing. But at the core, I was in. I wasn't on the outside anymore. I was the real deal. No one was more of a caseworker than I was, regardless of how I felt. Early Christians had sort of an identity crisis as they began to adopt a faith that sort of belonged to the Jews historically, but also the Jews kind of rejected it in a weird way. So like, think about this. Yahweh was the God of the Jews forever, since creation. They always followed him. He made lots of promises specifically to the nation of Israel, specifically to the Jews, a particular people group. But then when Jesus came, and Jesus was Yahweh, same person, Jesus opened up these promises to anyone in the world who would follow him. And many of the Jews, the OG Yahweh people, rejected Jesus, even though he was Yahweh. So, for these non-Israelites, these non-Jews, these pagans who accepted Jesus, were they like legit? Were they in? Or were they outsiders looking in? Halfway in. What were they supposed to do with God's promises in the Torah, in the law, that sounded really Jew-specific, really circumcision, really Israel-specific? First Peter was written to new believers like these who were trying to make sense of their identity. 
These weren't Sunday school kids who had been following Yahweh for generations. These were idol-worshiping heathens who one day met a missionary, maybe two years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and they were drawn to follow Jesus as they responded to God's word. So where do these former pagans fit in relation to those Israelites and the priests who had believed in Yahweh since creation? They'd been waiting for a Savior since the fall. And all of the promises of the Old Testament were written to them. Surely these new believers were like at best second-rate Christians, right? For what it's worth, what they were wrestling with in their identity, this is not an outdated issue. I still hear people asking these questions to me. They look at someone like me, a pastor, a pastor's kid, a pastor's grandkid, and they assume that I have some sort of special access to God that they don't. They assume that I'm like the OG Israel people and that somehow they are either more sinful or they're at least not called to live completely sold out for Jesus like I am because, I mean, but they have a real job after all. They can't do that. And there's some sort of separation like I'm over here, I'm in, and you're kind of, you're in, but kind of out, but kind of in. This is a real question that we still grapple with, and this is what the people were grappling with that Peter's writing to. So that's who's receiving the letter. Who's writing it? So in the early church, there were some big names, right? Like, we all like big names. We all like to know the famous people. So there was James, brother of Jesus. He was like the big pastor back in Jerusalem. There was John. He was like kind of the head pastor in Asia, which is actually where these churches are. Then there was Paul. He was that radical missionary guy. He was cool. But then there's Peter, the guy who's basically over all of these guys. He's the head honcho. He's like the Pope, literally. After Jesus himself, Peter is the next big dog. He's the innest in. This is Jesus' homeboy writing a letter to the distant fan club who feels like a fan club, kind of disconnected, a little less than and probably discouraged because not only do they feel like not cool kids in the Christian club, they're also now being hardcore bullied by their old friends, the pagans and the Romans. And we're talking bullied like persecution, like public beatings, like beheading people, like living with a backpack on ready to run at a moment's notice because you don't know what's going to happen today or tomorrow. Persecution, not like little relational conflict, like persecution, baby believers, not even sure if they're really in and experiencing persecution. So our homeboy celebrity, Jewist of Jews, Peter, is writing to these new kids on the block and to you and me today to reaffirm our sense of belonging, our authenticity as true children of God, and also to remind us that as children of God, we have a thrilling, terrifying Answer to prayer, responsibility. And that responsibility is to represent God to a hurting world. And so, in our passage today, Peter intentionally quotes the Old Testament over and over as if to say to these new believers, hey, you know those old promises that were for the Jews? Yeah, they're for you too, just as much as they're for me. Peter's message is, you are as real deal God's people as you can get. No one is more God's child than you are. So, let's start looking at the passage. Verses 1 through 3 say, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So, chapter 2 obviously comes after chapter 1, where Peter has just established that the people had come to follow Jesus, they had been born again. Therefore, as newborns with new life, meaning old life gone, they have new life, we need to put away our old lifestyle. The Greek words imply the metaphor of clothing. We need to take off our old clothes and put on a new something. You know, Keith makes the comment that you don't wear plumbing shirts twice. You don't wear the same shirt when, you know, what I'm, you know where I'm going with that? Like when you smell like, you know, you get rid of the old and you put on the new. 
So maybe we used to dress ourselves in slander or malice, but now we take that off. We don't dress like that anymore. And instead, Peter switches analogies here, metaphors, and he likens us to newborns who desire milk from the mother. He could have said, take off your old clothes and put on your new clothes, but he intentionally chooses a different image. He does say, take off your old clothes. So get rid of the slander, get rid of the envy, get rid of the malice. But then he switches to a new metaphor, which I think is really cool. You know, we often think of God as judge, as head of the church, the cornerstone, all of these like masculine kind of tough terms. Christ is head of the church, therefore you must listen to him. But male and female were both created in the image of God. So here, Peter chooses to use more of a feminine metaphor for God. Not saying God's a woman, God's a man. I'm just saying male and female look like God, so women look like God too. And so he uses a female metaphor so that we look like babies looking to a mother to nurture us. Breastfeeding is a gentle and intimate form of nourishment. It's not like pounding pizza at the store. Like It's pretty in your face or in your chest. <laughs> a mother literally opens up pretty intimately to the child, welcomes the child in, and then patiently gives the child the nourishment that the child needs. Kind of on the baby's time, but also it takes time, and it's a vulnerable act. In the same way, God wants to intimately open up himself to us and give us the abundant life sustenance that we need. Peter says we should long for this milk. Folks, I live with an infant. I tell you what, that child longs for milk. And when she's longing, you know it. Her desire is strong, and it's an instinct. She doesn't even have to try. It's just natural for her. As a newborn, she desires the milk. She does whatever it takes to get that milk. She Loves that milk. And in turn, she bonds with the source of the milk, her mother. We are called to love spiritual milk and to bond with its source. What is the spiritual milk? It's God's word. We are to put away deceit, put away slander, put away hypocrisy, which are all words used falsely and negatively and angrily. And instead, we are to fill ourselves with God's pure words that sustain our very life. We are to love spiritual milk and long for spiritual milk, hunger for it, strive for it. And why? so that we can grow up into salvation. Peter is telling these new believers, there's more to salvation than just being born again. And I would tell you, there's more to following Jesus than just getting saved. That's just being born. Now it's time to live, to grow. Salvation isn't a once and done thing. The fullness of salvation is still coming. None of us have received that. The fullness of salvation is something that we are being prepared for, something that we're growing into. Now, the Apostle Paul and the author of Hebrews, they talk about milk as if it's like baby food and you need to grow up from baby food and you need to eat some real steak. And that's a great metaphor. Totally different metaphor that Peter's going for here. He's saying that we all need, we're all born again, we're all infants before Christ, and we all need this spiritual nourishment from God. We're all continuing to grow in our understanding of what God has in store for us and in store for the world. So even Peter is still growing into his salvation. Even Peter is being nurtured by the word of God, being nurtured by this spiritual milk. So then, at the end of this, in in verse 3, he throws in this statement, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you have tasted that the Lord is good, you should be hungering for more. You know when you taste something and it's delicious? You want more of it. But this statement, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, is clearly alluding to Psalm 34. Now, Peter could have said anything. Why would he need to allude to Psalm 34? I want you to imagine yourself. You're a baby Christian living in Asia. This is before indoor plumbing. This is before cell phones. 
you don't know how to travel outside the town that you live in because you've never gone farther than the town limit. You're a new Christian following this new crazy religion. Everyone you know hates you. You're being persecuted. And you receive this letter from Peter, and he drops a hint that you should read Psalm 34. So you pull out Psalm 34, assuming you have access to it, which you may or may not. And this is what you read in Psalm 34. Listen to this. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Remember Keith last week talking about fear of the Lord? The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Evil, deceit, sound familiar? Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Peter's not denying persecution. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. This is the hope that the persecuted Christians needed to hear. This is God's word, the milk that sustains us. We need to be saturated in God's word, longing for God's word, so that through it we may grow and experience the fullness of salvation. Without this milk, without God's word, we're malnourished. And persecuted Christians can't be spiritually malnourished. They won't last. And for us, maybe we're not persecuted like they were, and we're not, at least yet. But we can't experience the salvation that God has for us as malnourished people. We have to grow. We have to long for this spiritual milk. So, that's section number one. Section number two, in verses four to eight, Peter switches metaphors again, this time to stones and buildings. First of all, he calls Jesus the living stone, which is kind of odd because stones were kind of known as being a dead thing. Fun fact, I looked up all of the times that the word stone appears in the New Testament, and unless it's quoting the same verses that these are quoting, the other times that the word stone appears, how a terrible father, how only a terrible father would give his son a worthless stone instead of bread, the stones that are used to stone people, the stones that cover tombs of dead people, the millstone that you should tie around your neck to commit suicide instead of causing someone to sin, and how if the disciples wouldn't cry out and sing praises, even the rocks, the dead stones would lift their voices. They're all, the stone is always used as a symbol of death, as a symbol of inanimate, as a symbol of nothingness. And yet, pagans who Peter is writing to, sometimes made idols out of stone and worshipped them. So Peter's playing on this paradox of <clears throat> Christ being a living stone to contrast life and death. The abundant life that we have in Christ, the living stone, compared to the pagans' previous empty, hopeless, lifeless way of living, Worshipping the dead stone. Jesus is a living stone. Peter also identifies Jesus as the corner stone. The stone in a building that is necessarily placed before any other stones because it serves as the foundation. And on the foundation of Jesus, the rest of us stones are built up so that together we make a spiritual house, the temple, the place where God dwells. You plus me plus you plus you plus you, built on top of each other, built on the foundation of Jesus, make up the place where God dwells. In this metaphor of a building, no one stone has any meaning in itself. You by yourself aren't that great. But you, plus all the other stones on the foundation of Jesus, 
make up the temple. A stone alone is pointless, but a stone chosen and carefully placed among the others can build the house of God. Number one in your handout, in Christ, I am a part of God's dwelling. I'm not the whole, I'm not all of it, and neither are you, but we are part of God's dwelling together. This is not an individual calling just to me or just to you. This is absolutely a corporate calling to all Christians together. This is why participating in a body of believers is so important. This is why partnership is so important here at Timberline. A stone that is unattached to the building is simply something to trip over. And that's where Peter goes next. For those who acknowledge Christ and follow him, Jesus is the cornerstone, man, the foundation, our solid rock. But Peter quotes three different Old Testament passages to make it very clear that to those who refuse to acknowledge Christ as their foundation, the living stone will be something that they will stumble over. Jesus is either your foundation or your downfall. Pun intended. So, y'all know that I broke my collarbone a few years back while biking in South America. But, much less exciting life experience of mine, when I was six years old, we were late to an event, and so I was rushing to get inside. Around the whole building, there was this really short sidewalk, probably just like two or three inches. And then at the entrance, there was this like concrete platform on top of the sidewalk that added an additional like nine or ten inches. Very different, you know, sidewalk, platform. So I'm, my little short body is running, because once, once upon a time I was short. My little short body is running and running and running, and I very easily cleared the three-inch sidewalk but I failed to acknowledge the larger stone that was in front of me. And to me, it became a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and I was put to shame. My little foot caught the edge of that stone, and my body slammed flat on the concrete. And among the first bodily impacts was the bottom of my face. And my chin collided quite harshly with the stone. And although the only visible bruise that ever came out of it was a tiny little brown mark on the tip of my chin, my jaw was quite broken. However, being unable to speak through my oral pain, having no visible bruises yet, having no witnesses to the event, and as a young child, unable to communicate effectively through hand gestures, no one knew what happened. And no one knew what to do. It was just a crying child. No one heeded my pleas. Until about lunchtime, I tried to take two bites of food and threw up. With a broken jaw. And the throwing up kind of clued people in that something must have happened here. And I tell that whole story to say, when we acknowledge the cornerstone that is in front of us, we can build a house on it, man. We can rely on Jesus. We can build our whole lives around him and his word. And we will not be put to shame. But if we do not acknowledge the stone that is in front of us, to us it will be a stone of stumbling. It will be something that offends us. Part of our responsibility as Christians is to show the world that Jesus isn't here to offend like a stumbling stone. It's our responsibility to show the world That Jesus is a foundation to be built on. We're not called to go about angrily saying, you're doing it wrong and you're doing it wrong. That makes Jesus look ugly. We're supposed to show people, show them with our love and with our lives that Christ is a foundation on which we can build and be strong. When we do acknowledge Jesus, Peter says that we also become living stones. We're alive. We have purpose and calling. And Peter goes on to describe this reality in verses 9 and 10. So that's where we're going next. And we're going to dig into what these verses are saying. But first, I think it would be helpful to acknowledge that these verses are basically pulling together multiple Old Testament quotes and smashing them all in one. Taking all of these old Jewish texts, and Peter is ascribing them to these new believers, reaffirming the fact that we are legitimately God's people. We are Israel. We're not like Israel. We're not a distant relative of God's people. We are God's people. And so he uses all of these Old Testament references 
that were given specifically to the Israelites to display to the new believers, you are as legit as you can get. So I want you to read this out loud with me because this applies to you just as much as it applies to me. So let's read this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, listen to these verses from the Old Testament, reading them word for word as they're found in ESV in their respective passages. First, we have, The Lord set his heart in love on your fathers. Can you go two slides up? The Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring, one more, and chose their offspring after them, You above all people. Do you see how that's talking about the race of Abraham, the race of his people? Your people group above all other people groups. I realize that's really small. Sorry about that. Next we have, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Next slide. That one, those two match up perfectly. Then we have, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Next one, the blue and the blue go together. Bring up the next one. That they, talking about Israel, might declare my praises, my excellencies. I will turn the darkness before them into light. And a perfect quote from Hosea. I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Peter is pulling all of these Old Testament passages together. Promises from God and saying, look New church in Asia, this is you. You are God's people. God has turned your darkness into light so that you can declare his praise. You are a chosen possession, a royal priesthood. You are a part of the race of Abraham. Peter's making it as clear as possible to these new believers that God has established their identity. The promises to the Jew have become the promises to the Christ follower. Jew or non-Jew doesn't matter. Peter makes no distinction, and that's true for us today. Likewise, it doesn't matter if you started following Jesus later in life. Going back to our modern analogy where people feel like I'm more special than they are, which is ridiculous. It doesn't matter if you became a Christian late. It doesn't matter if you don't have a great biblical understanding. Maybe you have a bad past, or your parents didn't follow Jesus. If you decide to follow Jesus now, you are part of the fam. You are a living stone. You are a priest. Scripture is one narrative, one big story that God is unfolding, and you and I are a part of it. We are just as much a part of it as Abraham or King David or Peter. We are God's people, chosen, called out, covenanted with the same covenant. All of us belong to God in the same way. We are all stones in God's dwelling. We are all called to long for spiritual milk. It doesn't matter whether you're the biblical scholar or the person who doesn't know it. You need more milk. Okay? If you're the kind of person who's like, well, I don't really understand the Bible, so therefore I don't really read it. Wrong. You need more milk. If you've been reading the Bible since you were two, you still need more milk. We're all the same. In this, this, the earth is flat. We're all in the same playing field. We all need to rid ourselves of sinful habits that all of us have biblical scholars, and newbies. We all need to rid ourselves of sin. We are, we are chosen by God. Prized possession, that's great. This is a great privilege that comes with great responsibility. And this is where things change flavor a little bit. Okay, You're God's people. Great. You're in. Great. And with that, we are all equally called, just like Israel always had been, to be set apart, to be holy, and also to be a royal priesthood, to be a kingdom of priests. Now, listen to the significance of this. We're talking about Mr. Pope himself, Peter. If anybody thinks that there should be priests and thinks that there should be important people in the kingdom of God, it would be Peter because he would be the most important person. And Peter is saying that in Christ, we don't have a priestly system like the Israelites did anymore. Pastors are no more holy than the layman. Jesus is the high priest to all of us, He's the cornerstone, and the rest of us are equally non-corner stones. 
But what that also means is that we are all equally called to be a priest. People come to me all the time, well, you're a pastor, can you do this? Excuse me, you were called to be a priest too. We are all equally called to the same thing. In the same way that we're on the same level, I'm not holier than you. I'm not more special to God than you. You are just as called as I am to be a kingdom of priests. You don't get to skirt through life and be like, well, I'm going to follow Jesus, and, but I'm not the pastor type. I'm not the priest type. I'm just going to be the low-key one. There is no low-key one. If you're in, you're in. You're a caseworker now, and you have a caseload, and you need to go knock on some doors. Ooh, I didn't even think of that analogy. That's a good one. <laughs> As building stones share the making of a whole, they make the whole building look beautiful. Each, each stone has a responsibility to make the building look beautiful. Each stone bears the weight of the other stones. Each stone together keeps out the cold, because if we're missing a stone, the cold's going to get in. Each stone provides shelter and protection. In the same way, we as priests, can I get some slides? We as priests put God's beauty on display to the world. Give you time to write that one down, and then we'll move to the next. Just like the stones that work together, we as priests need to work together to, one, put God on display to the world, two, to bear the weight and support the other stones by showing others their way to Jesus. There's a couple more slides coming up yet. Ooh, that slide did not translate at all. I have to fix that later. Three, can you read it there? We need to intercede on behalf of the world, fighting the world's enemies, even if the world's not willing to fight their own enemies. And four, to provide shelter and protection to anyone in need. Now, I realize these two lists don't exactly line up. I wasn't even trying to go about that. Sorry, the slide looks like a mess. But what the point is here, the role of a priest is a universal calling for all believers alike. We are to live this calling out universally as well. All of us are called to it, and we're called to the whole world. The role of a priest is always God-centered. This is the next slide and the next point in your handout. The role of a priest is always God-centered. If we are putting God on display, we're pointing them to God. That's God-centered. If we're helping others navigate their relationship with God, that's obviously about God. To intercede for others is to take their concerns before God. And to distribute resources to the needy in the world is to take God's resources and bless people in Jesus' name, which is obeying God's calling. All of these things are God-centered acts. The roles of a priest are also world blessing. God told Abraham that God wanted to bless the world through Abraham and his race. And Peter just told us we're a part of that race. If we put God on display, we're putting him on display to the world around us. If we're helping others navigate their relationship to God, we're helping them find God. That's others' focus, world blessing. If we're interceding for others, that is God-centered and world blessing. Distributing resources to those in need, same. God-centered, world blessing. Regardless of how long you have followed Jesus, regardless of how deep your understanding is at this moment, any who are willing to follow Christ are a real deal Christian. You're not half a Christian. You're not half of God's people. You're just as much God's people as Abraham and Israel. But in humility, if you're God's people, if you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we need more spiritual milk. We should long for it. We should seek it with our whole being, just like my daughter seeks milk with her whole being. We need the word of God to nourish and guide every corner of our lives. And God has great responsibility for all of us. A universal call to bring God's marvelous light to the world. And we're not done yet. Timberline. Saints. Priests. We're not done yet. There is a lot of work to do. We don't put God on display to the world through our agendas and through our self-righteous anger, but through our love and through our lives. Child welfare caseworkers have a terrible reputation in the community. 
because of a few caseworkers who really stink at their job. A few caseworkers who are angry, policy-driven, inhospitable, and impatient make the stereotype that you're probably familiar with. Jesus has a terrible reputation in our communities because of a few Christians who think they don't need spiritual milk and therefore are angry, inhospitable, impatient, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, and this train wreck arrogance and me-focused stinginess that they really think is what it means to follow Jesus because I'm doing what's right makes Jesus look like a God to run away from. Makes Jesus look like a God who is only here to offend you because that's why I'm here. It's our call to put God on display in a way that honors him, glorifies him, and makes people want to follow him and want to build their life on that foundation. Do I want to build a life on the foundation that your life is representing? Think about that. Do I want to build my whole life around the foundation that you are presenting to me in your actions and in your words? Let's put, on, let's put God on display the way he is. His beauty, his gentleness, his courage, his hospitality, his hope, his justice, his self-control, his truth, his love. God, we desire to fulfill the role that you have given us. We are so grateful that you have invited us in, into the Holy of Holies. You have filled us with your presence. We get to be the house of the living God. You are with us always. We who did not use to have mercy now have mercy. We who were nobodies are now God's people. And you've given us the opportunity and the responsibility to then put that on display and be priests to the world. And you've even shown us what that means and how we can go about that. Lord, help us to go about that well. Help us to long for it, to seek it, to seek you with our whole heart, with our whole mind, with our whole body, that we would surrender everything to you so that you would be made known, that the world would see and glorify you. And if we experience persecution, and if we experience pushback, so be it. What a better opportunity to provide even more light, to shine even more like you in your kindness and in your humility. Lord, if persecution is what it takes to shine your light so that people can see it, by all means, for the sake of your kingdom, bring it. But Lord, to do that, our hearts need to be lost in love with you. Would you draw us into that relationship with you? In Jesus' name, amen. You may stand for a benediction. Timberline. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Jesus, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Timberline, go and walk in his marvelous light. Light. You're dismissed.